created live on Fireside. Hello, everyone here in Fireside. Um, welcome to the Encounters in EdTech show. Uh, and today I have got um, Laurie Jones, who is, um, she and I were doing a Master's of Educational Technology together, and she is a long-term thinker in uh, universal and inclusive design, uh, both for teaching and, um, and, and digital design. And uh, uh, yeah, um, so I'm thrilled to have her on the show because that's exactly what we're going to be exploring today is universal design and inclusive design. And on that note, do you, do you want to just, just introduce yourself and tell us uh, about what universal design is and means to you? Sure. Um, I'm Laurie Jones. Um, I was a K-12 teacher for 20 years. Um, I now work... Uh, for the British Columbia Teachers Federation, although I'm not here in that role, I'm here as a teacher. Um, and I have been working pretty heavily in universal design for a number of years, although the masters in educational technology that Erica and I were in together um, definitely spurred that to a new level. Um, the first time I heard universal design, I think I heard a very, um, probably a very common uh, definition that I don't think is accurate um, and that it was you have to design for everyone and that it's onerous and that you need to do it um, after you've designed whatever you're creating whether it's a platform or a lesson or um, any of those things and and what I, if there's anything that I can get people to take away from this is that, that that's not the case universal design comes at the very beginning um, it's much easier to put in uh, accessibility and all of those sorts of things at the very beginning when you're planning. And so um, my definition now is really about creating infrastructure um, that will allow for uh, a multitude of accessibility needs in whatever you're doing, whether it's uh, an in-person lesson, whether it's an online platform, whether it's a digital space that you are creating as a, you know, just for fun or any of those sorts of things. I think it's really important to consider um, accessibility needs and universal design has kind of gotten a bad name um, in that realm because it's it, it has the connotation of being very onerous and it doesn't have to be. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. We're 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 gonna delve a little bit further into that um, as as we go through the show, and um, dependent, uh, we may have um, uh, a friend of mine um, who's a mom of two two very different kids, and uh, sort of uh, also sort of grew up at a time when. Um, school systems weren't really thinking of these things um mm -hmm. uh as 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 with you and i have grown up at that time yeah um, very aware and, <laughs> so uh, so she may join us later on the show to kind of you know add in her her two cents as um as, as a mom and as a psychologist and um but for now um i i just thought i'd uh, sort of uh, share a bit of the impetus around the show. Um, so in recent weeks, I've been sort of studying universal design uh, in learning as a part of a course from Paul Hamilton at Vancouver Island University. Mm -hmm. And so so as I've been sort of delving into this course, um, I've been like sort of been introduced to the cast definition of universal design for learning, which is being a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people yeah. based on scientific insights on, on how humans learn. Mm -hmm. And so, so as I sort of have been approaching this, um, for me, universal design for learning means creating with choice and accessibility in mind so mm -hmm. that students don't have to ask for modifications. Um, right. and, you know, I still want to create that, that, um, that, safe space where if if there is something um that they do need a modification on or something i haven't thought of that there's mm -hmm. still that space and that environment that uh that students uh, know that they can um but uh but but where you know um 
hopefully, you know, much of what I've already designed, um, it is meeting their needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and with that, like, you know, it's kind of approaching it from the standpoint that every learner is different, meaning we all have different needs, things that we excel at and things that we struggle with. So creating different options and pathways to learn, uh, makes sense as it gives everyone the opportunity to excel. Um, and so for me, um, I'm somebody who's dyslexic. Um, and so, so this makes a lot of sense from kind of my youth growing up because I, I'd often find that um, I'd run into walls when I stuck with um, like sometimes with one pathway and often the pathway that, you know, sort of we were introduced to in school. Mm -hmm. I I would I would run into walls and obstacles Mm -hmm. and so as a kid I kind of became really good at problem solving because I figured that um, I I could I could reach the same goals but by finding a different pathway around that wall Mm -hmm. Um, and then in recent years I've been kind of thinking about this a lot just because um as as Laurie's aware um and some some of our regulars to the show like uh Marwan um I I'm somebody um who has had a car accident well two car accidents in the in the last nine years and uh those those presented me with some 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 newer disabilities in the form of chronic pain and chronic fatigue and um, uh, post-concussion syndrome and through that journey I have kind of ended up in a lot of hospital programs and uh, one of the things I, I, I learned in those hospital programs is it's kind of the same with our with our bodies like you know as I was um approaching um finding a way to move forward um, and and manage my symptoms around uh, chronic pain and chronic fatigue and, and then my concussion symptoms later on. What worked for one person might not work for me. And uh, similarly, what worked for me might not work for, for somebody. Yeah, and I but I think that there's a piece of that that um, we can build yeah, into right. design that that actually um, affords people to make the choice of what works for them. And I think that's the key to universal design is creating that framework that you have the choice to do it the way that works for you. And I think that there needs to be maybe a little bit more discussion in education about letting people with disabilities um, the disabled make choices because they actually know themselves and they know their disability um, far better than most people that are trying to help them. And so creating choice in the way that you deliver or the way that you set up something um, allows them to make that choice for themselves in the moment. And it could change day to day. And, it, and it's important to understand <clears throat> too that whether, whether we're aware of it or not, like, and whether we've, whether we have a dis, you know, a disability that's recognized or not, all of us as learners have have things we struggle with. All of us have things we excel at, right? Mm-hmm. We so, all have preferences, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and there's so, this fallacy about normal, um, about the norm. As a teacher, I think, or an educator, you're trying to hit on for the most part, the middle, like we're going to teach to them, we're going to educate to the middle, we're going to, that's your, you know, the framework has been developed around the middle, which is a normative kind of thing. And the reality is, is that normative doesn't exist. No, no. Um, In fact, I just, um, as as a part of my coursework, I just watched this um, TEDx uh, video that was all, or it was called um, the myth of, um, myth of averages. And so it yeah. was it was Todd Ross uh, from TEDx Sonoma County um, who was 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 sharing that um, back in the day with U.S. Uh, fighter jets, they mm-hmm. used to create the fighter jets for the normal fighter pilot and yeah. for their body. And apparently, the cockpit had no ways of changing 
anything for anyone, fighter pilot. Um, and so this was presenting a problem because nobody was fully comfortable and you had to be a certain size and, you know, um, in order to, to fit the, uh, the plane. Um, mm -hmm. And so apparently, um, I guess the, the U.S. Armed Forces um, started to do some research into some studies in this with their, their fighter pilots. And they discovered that not a single one of their fighter pilots actually fit the norm of what mm -hmm. these these cockpits were uh, being designed for um, and so so what um, uh, so the armed forces said that they needed to to design these um, cockpits for 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 the fighter jets so that they sort of um, kind of rather than you know, being for this normal size person so that they stretched out to, to various, you know, um, um, the various, uh, range, uh, of mm -hmm. pilots. Um, and, and initially like there was kind of a fight back from the company saying that, oh no, it would be too expensive and, and everything else. And, uh, I guess they were about to lose the contract. So all of a sudden all this became possible and the solutions turned out not to be costly because the same sort of solutions that we have in our car where we have adjustable seats. Um, and, and as a result too, it's uh, now changed the, the face of, of who is a fighter pilot now uh, within the U S armed forces, because mm -hmm. it made it accessible to a greater variety of people. Yeah. And I think we, what you're hitting on there is that we're, in a lot of cases, trying to reformat a structure um, for accessibility rather than creating the accessibility at the beginning. And I think there's a big shift in society um, for universal design in all realms. And I think education is absolutely the place where that's going to happen, uh, especially here in BC, uh, probably first, um, is that it has to be considered when the program is being created because yeah, I, you know, trying to add accessibility pieces after the fact can be more work um, if you haven't thought about it at the beginning. And I think that there has to be a shift to considering what your universal design looks like before you start, because, I mean, they got lucky in the fire, fighter pilot situation that it wasn't too costly to change those things. But had they thought about it at the beginning, um, it just would have been part of the infrastructure and no one would have thought anything of adding a seat, like what's in a car. Um, exactly. I think so. I, so I think it's a mindset change. It's a change in um, looking at things from a perspective of how can I design this, whatever it is that you're designing to allow for choice for the most people. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and so I think what we're also hitting on here too is there's so for for a while now and, and especially you know coming from um the standpoint of people who have adopted the term inclusive design um mm -hmm. there's this fallacy out there that where universal design gets misinterpreted as being one size fits all yeah um and and and, th and that's not what what we're really saying or what we're what we're explaining with this this universal with universal design just like going back to that that cockpit example can you share from your perspective why that doesn't work with learners or in the classroom well yeah i mean you you touched on it at the beginning and saying that whatever you know some things work for symptoms that you have versus you know, someone who may have be diagnosed with the exact same, let's say they were given the exact same parameters of diagnosis, and they need something totally different. Um, there's so much individual need um, within accessibility, whether it's hearing, seeing it, I mean, it, mobility, intellectual, it doesn't matter what it is, there's a range. And so to, to I think it's the silver bullet kind of um <clears throat> idea that you can design something that's the silver bullet that's going to be work for everyone and um it's one size fits all and look at i've done this silver bullet kind of thing and that's not the case it's about 
creating options and choice for people to choose where they access um, for, in this case, learning, where how they access learning that works for them. And so I, um, I have a physical disability. Um, I'm in a wheelchair. So, you know, I can sit at the bottom of a set of stairs and wish them to be a ramp for as long as I'd like, and that's not going to happen. Um, there's some good cartoons out there about that. Um, or, you know, the, the standard education one with the fence and the baseball game of whether or not you put uh, crates underneath it. Uh, are they the same size? All the people are different heights. When the reality of it is, is why don't you just remove the fence? Um, mm. And so I think it's about removing obstacles that aren't necessary when creating universally designed um, courses or inclusively designed courses is so that, or, you know, digital spaces is so that people can access it how they need to access it in order to participate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, uh, you know, kind of also sort of just, I was thinking of when, when we're talking about that one size fits all and how that doesn't quite work. Um, as well, I was thinking about um, a gentleman who was in our master's program um, with us, and he was dealing with a long-term concussion, just like like I am. Mm -hmm. And um, for him, because because you know he, I, I chat with him occasionally about you know, you know how with with all the reading and all the online reading that we mm -hmm. had, how he was dealing with that without you know ending up with. Um, enormous headaches mm -hmm. um or or you know worse mm -hmm. yet you know actually triggering you know the dizziness and the full-on concussion symptoms again yeah um, which I may have done on a few occasions <laughs> during this last <laughs> yeah I'm sure um and uh in, in in his scenario um he 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 uses auto like those sort of the different um, audio readers that, uh, yeah. you know, with the electronic voices that, that will read out, mm -hmm. um, content for you. Uh, and for me that actually triggers my symptoms. Um, and so I need natural voices, um, in order to, um, in order to be able to, to conserve, consume mm -hmm. that without sort of, you know, making, you know, setting, setting myself backwards again. Um, right. um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, cause I, it's actually, in a, well, it's a story I'll get into a little later in the podcast. Um, just simply cause, um, I think it's when I was dealing with all of that in my masters, um, I wasn't presented with a variety of options. And right. uh, so in the last week, I've been discovering new solutions because in the course I'm currently taking, I have been presented with numerous options mm -hmm. um, and pathways forward. Um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting just because um, you know, because as, as a student in that scenario, I was just trying to like, you're treading water, right? You, right. I was, I was, when I needed it, I was in that heightened state uh, of, of symptoms and issues. And, uh, and I was, so I, I was, I was needing somebody else's help at that stage of the game. Yeah. Um, and then, and then as you, you know, kind of move forward, um, you're almost, well, I think with, with that stuff, in my case, I was in a little bit of a fight or flight scenario of, of not, you know, of, of not taking the time myself to explore because I had this mountain of work before me and, I was so afraid of re-triggering everything to kind of come tumbling, you know, that, that would potentially set me backwards again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I think a lot of this speaks to um, communities, whether uh, um, I'm going to speak from the, the standpoint of a dis, of the disabled community where having those people having to advocate for themselves for everything. So, 
there is something to be said about giving and uh, disabled people choice and a, an ability to communicate what works for them. Um, there's something else to be said that I'm going to design this in a way that works for disabled people when you're not disabled. Um, and I think that the best attempts are made in education and it's not, I mean, this isn't a judgment because I've done it myself. I mean, before I was in a wheelchair, I had no, I had no frame of reference for what this looked like. Um, and my situation is completely different than someone else. And so, but it did open my eyes to thinking about what other things do I do on a daily basis or do I have as part of my, uh, mental framework for how things should work as an educator um, that are completely missing a, a, a very large section of people. And I think that that comes from the idea of someone being temporary able-bodied um, or able, you know, um, using the term tab in mm -hmm. that the reality is, is that in 80% of people, disability is going to come in some form or another um, within your lifetime. And so are we creating opportunities for that to happen and noticing that that is the case? And I don't think we're doing a very good job of it in all honesty, um, on the whole, but I do think that there's progress being made. And so you were talking about those readers and how it's different for you versus, um, the other person that was in our program. And I used those readers. Um, I don't have any of those symptoms that you're talking about. And I think that this is part of speaking to universal design and for creating options is that I used those readers because I was working full time and I still had that volume of information to get through. And because I was working full time in a digital environment because I taught digital things, my screen time was through the roof. And yeah. so by the time I got to the point where I was trying to read all of those things and absorb them, I didn't have the ability to do it anymore. And it was fatigue. And so I used those readers as a supplement to help me get through the volume of um, information that was there. And it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't because I was, I have a disability in that regard. It was because I chose to do that at that point in order to compensate for day-to-day -day fatigue. Well, and, and I mean, I noticed that in my classes too, because once people realized that I had access to these um, audio recordings that, that were done in, you know, in real people, real voices, mm -hmm. um, there was a number of people in the class that for, for reasons like you just expressed, you know, asked, you know, hey, can, can, can I have access to that as well? Um, yes, I benefited from that. Thank you very well, much. Yeah, you were one of them. <laughs> right. um, and, and, and that was the, the, I mean, and this is, this is also goes back to that thing too, about when we're talking about giving people access to that, I was totally breaking the rules of an agreement that I assigned with UBC that I would not give those audio recordings to anybody else um but i realized that other people could um benefit from them so um i i chose to ignore that um, well and i think that's something we should touch on is why are we creating parameters in an academic situation that says your learning is not valid because you use this support and i think that that's the part that we're missing very, very much, especially in post-secondary education, is that you must adhere to this academic way of framework of doing things. And um, who made the rules? <laughs> and why are they, you know, why are they so strict? If I'm learning and I'm participating and I'm able to get through the content, what difference does it make if I hear the person, someone of real voice read it to me, or if I've read it myself? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this goes to like, so, um, I mean, we were both students at, um, well, and I, I'm, I still am, I have two classes left, this, <laughs> this being one of them, um, uh, at, uh, at UBC and, um, UBC talks, talks up a big game on, on the importance of, uh, inclusivity, but mm -hmm. 
one of the things that I've kind of started learning um, through this class and kind of looking at, and I mean, I, I knew there was a few times where I was um, questioning about how inclusive and how accessible things were, like in mm -hmm. the case of, of, of these audio re readings and recordings. Um, but like kind of, you know, seeing how things have been laid out in this course, and then also kind of comparing and looking at the resources that are available where I teach at BCIT, uh, and kind of exploring the differences between the two. UBC is not at all inclusive. Like when I had my head injury, I was given two choices. I was given the choice of, well, actually, initially I was only given one choice because they wanted to push me in the direction of one thing, which was read and write gold. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a program for those of you that aren't familiar for people with dyslexia. Um, but, uh, it's got an audio reader, you know, that's, that's built into the thing, um, as a part of it. And, um, it, it didn't, it didn't work for me. It, it made my symptoms worse. So only when that didn't work, was I given the second option, which was having, um, you know, somebody basically create audio recordings of my, my, my work. With, or, or sorry, of the, of the readings that I was going to do, um, which I, I was greatly appreciative of. Uh, was it perfect? No, because um, it meant I had to depend on instructors giving me the readings in advance. Mm -hmm. And if you're taking a course where it's more based around engagement with your peers, um, I was kind of left, you know, just to deal. I was always super appreciative of you, by the way, Lori, with your audio recorded <laughs> readings that you would do, <laughs> do in your assignments because it made yeah. it so much easier for me. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, so, so, and I was never given any other options. And so, and because as I said, I didn't have the time or the wherewithal you know, to really explore those other options uh, on my own, like to go and find them and explore them. I didn't know just how many accessibility tools were out there. Mm -hmm. And so over the course of the last week, I've kind of looked to see like, you know, if some of these accessibility tools were already in the accessibility center and open to all UBC students, or not. And they don't even talk about them on the website, let alone make them open no. to all the students. Whereas well, at and BCIT, I think that there's this I did the same search at BCIT. Yeah. Those are open to everybody. Whether And I think that that's that's the key, right? We're the reason that it was so difficult for you to get someone to read your your readings to you is because no one thought of it when they were designing the course. Mm -hmm. No one thought that there might be somebody who might need that uh you know option and so universal design i think it's about opening your mind to what might be something that you could include in what you're doing as a choice that would help everyone so i'm going to use closed captioning as the as the example um so there are closed captioning tools that will do live broadcasting that's not really a problem um, YouTube has it built in if you're going to use YouTube as your platform. Um, can you go in and edit them? Yeah, you can after the fact go in and edit them. So if you create text documents, you can put them in and have it match because we've all had that situation where you're watching closed captioning and it says something completely different than what the person has actually said, especially if you're doing something that's translated into another language. But I, I, I take the scenario of my partner is, um, ha is hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. and wears hearing aids and I'm just going to use television as an example the new hearing aids that they have can link directly to our tv and the tv can then they can adjust the volume for themselves through the hearing aids now we always have closed captioning on regardless of what we're watching is that a hindrance is it an issue should it no and the reason I say that is Look at the number of multi-generational uh, houses we have 
and you know, I mean, housing costs is going to do that. But as we age, most people lose pieces of their hearing. So you get this situation where the TV is exceptionally loud, let's say, in order for someone with hearing loss to be able to hear what's going on. Put that in a multi-generational home and potentially you have a baby. And how is that going to work? Closed captioning allows for the volume to go down and for everybody to hear and for everybody to be participate and to do all of those things. And so I think that, and that's not an educational setting. I'm saying this is just in everyday life. And so how can these things be incorporated into what we're doing so that they're beneficial to everyone? Because in that situation, I loved having those recordings that you had and they weren't offered to me or an option to me because I wasn't um, accessing the accessibility center and saying, I need these things. And so I think that we have to reevaluate what we think is support and why is it taken away or only given to a select group of people in order to accomplish a task. Yeah. Yeah. And now in this, like, so, so one of the things like I've noticed at BCIT too is like I teach online there and yeah. in my online classes at BCIT, um, they now have um, they they've been building in those tools into the platform to help all the teachers to make their courses more accessible. So right. one of the new um, additions is any readings within my class. Mm -hmm. Now, once again, this is not the perfect solution. It's no. one that I want to go in and you know sort of add in my my own um, addition to later on but they all mm -hmm. now have an automatic audio reader at the top of the page so Which is fantastic. people can just click a button and they don't have to look for an audio reader anywhere they just mm -hmm. click a button and 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 they can listen to to the course reading right um and it's actually and i i, I know you had some problems um uh with with fireside um you know, so did boarding yesterday, which isn't good. And I'm going to let them know. <laughs> um, but one of the things I do love about this app and I, the reason why I wanted to kind of use it, why we were, um, doing, why we were wanting to use it for, for this, this podcast is because there are a number of different kind of universal design functions built into, mm -hmm. to the app. So um, I'm not seeing it right now, um, and I'm hoping they didn't remove it. Um, but one of the things is it does live trans transcriptions. Why? Which you... is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And then later on, like once we get the once this the show's wrapped up, um, it wasn't working perfectly the last time I tried it, but hopefully it's improved since then. Um, but you can actually go in and then you can edit that transcript because of, yeah, that's course. what I was saying. There's so many platforms that are doing that now. And I yeah. think that's a huge, a huge bonus to being able to do, you know, to create some accessibility within, um, digital spaces. Yeah. And then there's ways that people can engage within this app itself, um, that gives them all sorts of options. So, uh, you can, for example, um, I'm, I'm going to do the um, um, a heart button right now reaction because uh, I see that Carrie has now joined us. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, sending out my heart and my love to, to both Carrie and you, Lori. Um, I could also then, um, you know, put one of those reactions up and also type in a message uh, so I'm going to do, I love you guys. Um, and everybody within our show will be able to read that. Oh, I said, I love guys. <laughs> How appropriate. <laughs> Let's fix that too. I meant, I love you guys. Apparently talking and typing is... At the same uh, time, does it work well? No. <laughs> Um, that, um, that's quite okay. the truth comes out. So, yeah, the truth comes out. <laughs> uh, and, and then 
And then it also like, you know, gives, gives, you know, the option too that, okay, so uh, say Marwan or Ray who have, um, I'm, I'm very grateful that the two of you have joined us, joined us for, for the show in its entirety so far. So if for, and, and this is an open invitation to you both, if, if, either of you want to come and join um, Carrie and Lori and I up here on the stage and uh, share comments or stories or ask questions and you don't feel like typing it but you would rather speak it, um, this this app also allows for, for that option too. And um, Carrie and Lori, you'll both see that you have a producer um, um little slate beside you and yeah. that's because if you wish to actually share something like by showing people as opposed to describing it you can click on the two lines at the bottom and uh up at the top you'll see turn on video and so i'm turning on the video right now so you can oh see. there's the tortie <laughs> yep yeah, there's 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 my little co-producer perfect and then if i want to yeah, when I talk, she feels it's important that I give her most of the attention. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Hence the, hence the kisses. Now, I just tap on the screen again and click turn off, and I can be back to, you know, so that everybody doesn't realize that I'm being mauled by a cat while I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's a lot of... Um great features and technology. I think one of the things we have to be careful of, and this, this goes back to that idea that you need natural voices to read things to you, is we have to, to be careful uh, thinking that technology is going to solve all the problems because for some folks, it, it does not. It actually creates, a, you know, is actually a little bit harder for them. Um, and so universal design technology is not always the answer. Um, it does afford a lot of things that were not available prior to technology, but it does require some design thinking in what options are you going to make available? So is your text available on paper and potentially colored paper? Cause there are some, uh, you know, disabilities that text is not legible unless it's on a certain color of paper. Um, and so is that available? And so it does require a little bit of thinking uh, before you move forward into actually, you know, operationalizing what you're doing. Um, Absolutely. Um, so just just taking a pause right there, since we've had uh, Carrie join us. Carrie, would yeah. you mind uh, just sort of introducing yourself and sort of uh, sharing what, uh, what, what universal design means to you and hey, why, why you feel it's important. Yeah. Thanks, Erica. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? You are. Beautiful. So hi there. I am Carrie. I am joining you from Canada, specifically Southern Ontario. Um, and I think when I hear universal design, I hear intention. So sometimes it's the intention to include, sometimes it's the intention to accommodate, sometimes it's the intention to be inclusive. Um, but I think my comment really um, connects in with what Lori just said in regard to the idea that there isn't one single perfect accommodation that that will work for everyone. And there's not one single perfect accommodation that will work for every situation, um, be it either the learner or the um, information provider. Um, so I really like the idea of um, universal concepts to, to be the idea that we're gonna now network, we're gonna now look, we're gonna now explore, we're gonna now seek to meet these um, objectives and these intentions and that it's, you know, a, a very open and um, respectful space where all of the, like the interested parties, the people receiving the information, the people providing the information work to collaborate to make sure that there is actually success. Um, so that's sort of really 
a very, very broad perspective, but it really does summarize my perspective that there isn't one way, one modality that needs to be covered to allow for everyone to be included. Without, um, thank you, Carrie, I totally agree with you. And without, you know, getting too far into some of the coursework that Erica and I have done, um, simple things like giving disabled folks the ability to communicate what they need. Now, I'm not saying they should be the ones communicating. We should have some things built in so that it's accessible, but also recognizing that they can talk about or not talk about, but communicate what's um what they need. And I'm really specifically using the word communicate instead of giving, saying, giving them a voice or saying talk, because it really depends on the disability, how that person is going to communicate with you. And so intention actually has to start with the idea that folks that have a disability, I'm going to just use disability or that need something in some area, um, have the, they understand that they need that. And there has to be a way for them to communicate that that's the case. And I think that we have to get away from saying that we need to give them a voice or tell them that they need to talk to us because that's not the reality for some folks. Um, and so I've, I've moved to communicate because I think that there's many modalities in the world, in the way that we can communicate what we need. Um, and so that individual need is about relationship, which Erica touched on at the very beginning, is about creating that safe space and that relationship to be able to say, okay, you've put these things in place, but actually this, this other thing is missing for me. And, and so what you touched on there too is, is, is just because not everybody might be, might have thought of it yet. Uh, whereas, whereas you and I took a course at this time last year that, that explored this, but, but mm -hmm. you're touching on sort of, uh, you touched on words that we have in our society that are, that are ableistic. Um, yeah. and so, so, so these underlying terms that we use that, um, that essentially exclude people. Um, mm -hmm. Like when you say, um, um, look, well, using the word communicate as opposed to, to see or hear, um, because cause it's, it doesn't exclude anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I, I, I mean, there's many ways to communicate. Uh, there, I just watched a TED Talk. We were talking about TED Talks earlier. Um, I just watched a TED Talk on, uh, they now have a, a neural implant that they've created that you can be, that can put, be put in with the catheter instead of having to have uh, surgery. And so they put it in through into the main vein that goes into the brain. This is for folks with ALS or other things where motor systems have, um, shut down and they can no longer communicate verbally or written or any of those kinds of things. But cognitively, everything is essentially um, still functioning, that this neural implant uh, has the ability now that there's a bunch of folks that can tweet directly um, their thoughts. And it's based on creating, they've mapped thought patterns to create, to um, sort of digital controls up down click uh backspace and there's people who are tweeting simply by thinking and so i i know we're headed there's going to be lots of technological developments but the idea that everyone can communicate is i think something that we have to uh explore a little bit further how people communicate is something that we have to have intention around um, figuring out for that individual in that individual relationship with that person. And I think that that speaks to universal design, not being a one size fits all and not being a silver bullet and not being about, I'm going to do this one thing and I will be set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now just, just in terms of, um, kind of like thinking in terms of uh, the framework for universal design um, and learning. It, it, it's designed around um, a framework of providing multiple means of engagement, 
multiple means of representation and multiple means of action and expression. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to, I mean, that may sound daunting at first and, and, and we'll get yeah, to a little overwhelming. Some... <laughs> it does. So, <laughs> so, so given that, um, you know, sort of as a teacher and a web designer, Lori, how do you mm-hmm. sort of approach multiple means of engagement? Well, I think the first thing I have to do is realize that I'm not going to be able to provide everything, especially let's say I'm designing a digital space. It is a digital space. It's it's meant to be a digital space. And so I'm not saying that I'm going to be able to provide the colored piece of paper for the folks that need it. However, I can provide options for them to find a way to do those things. So by creating text that also has a PDF button that they can download and print on the paper that they need in order to read it, I've provided an option. Um, all of the digital spaces where I have text every single time there is an audio recording of it and all you have to do is click on it to hear it. Um, That may seem like, Oh my goodness, that's so much work. But actually when you're putting it together, it's really not. Um, We were talking earlier about me having audio attached to all of my assignments and that was actually part of proofreading for me. So um, I would write what I needed to write because most people want text or, you know, our courses wanted it posted as a blog post or whatever. And so I'm writing what I am doing, but in the process of writing, I have to proofread it. And the best way to proofread it is to read it out loud to know where you're missing things. And so I would just record it. And I think what you're hitting on right now is, is what they're terming as representation, um, Mm -hmm. which is awesome. And I was actually going to point out (laughs) the, uh, the, the, you know, the story of, of, of how you would um, share those audio files. How about engagement? Like, so how about actually engaging, engaging those um, people in your class? Oh, about in, in terms of interacting with what I've created? Yeah. Like, in, um, or interacting with each other or with the materials. Yeah. Yeah. Multiple ways to do that. So um, it's about choice. So, and choice can come in the form of, uh, let's say I was teaching, I am, I was teaching a digital course however, in an in-person scenario in a classroom um, is giving the option of, okay, join this, let's say, uh, interactive document that everyone can, you know, uh, put thoughts into, or take this piece of paper and go and sit at this table and have a conversation. So just having the ability to do multiple things to engage them so that they can enter into the learning where they're able to enter into the learning. And I think that that's the key is what entry point are you giving students that may, because all students have differences. There's, you're not going to find that normal like we were talking about with the cockpit that doesn't exist. And so to think that, oh, well, you know, students will just do this. You're probably excluding 75, 80% of the people and thinking that you're actually including them. And so it's about giving choice so that interacting and engaging becomes something that students want to do. And they want to do it because they know they can do it, how works best for them and get something out of it. And, and, and then um, sort of in this, this may be repetitive, but, um, but how, what does, what does that mean for you with action and expression? with action and expression. Um, Well, for me, it's about, I guess what they're producing, right? Yeah, I don't. So when in my classroom, um, I didn't have a, you have to submit a 500 word essay. I had a, we would like to get to the point where we've discussed or, or have communicated about this topic, go forth and do so. And whichever, I would provide options because you were saying, you know, you didn't get a chance to explore and some of them weren't provided. So I would say, you know, you might want to check out, uh, let's say flip Flipgrid and have a look. You could do it that way. Um, so you're doing a video, you could do it vlog style, go check out some YouTube videos. You want to blog. Okay. Do a blog. If you would like to write me the, the 500 word essay and because you're strong at English language written word, and you want to print it on a piece of paper because that works for you, then hand that in. Um, If you're an art student, 
and you can communicate through a series of images exactly what we're talking about and it's in-depth um, thinking and critical thinking and you've really put a lot of thought and effort into it, do that. My assignments were never anything, and I worked in K-12, to so this is not post-secondary. Um, my assignments were never anything that was, it has to be handed in to me this way. Nice, nice. Um, now, Carrie, you, how would you like sort of kind of coming, coming, approaching, you know, these, these different ways, like multiple means of engagement, representation and action expression. Um, how would you approach that as a parent or sort of looking in on the school system and what your, what your boys were sort of presented with or expected? to mm. have happened within their classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, so my previous comment was undoubtedly influenced by, by what you just asked me. And I, I noticed that there were scenarios where there was, uh, you know, one academic leading person where um, accommodations and um, sensitivities to strengths and challenges were second nature and and it was an integrated part of the program and then there were other academic supervisors that uh, you know sort of didn't have that strength themselves or didn't invest in it as an option um <clears throat> and uh interestingly as a parent um i guess i say i say interestingly because i had been participating in this conversation um, as my own sort of autonomous person. But when you ask me as a parent, I didn't have the same perspective as I had three seconds ago, three minutes ago. Um, as much as I valued and respected and appreciated and always, I think, thoroughly communicated my appreciation of the teachers who were accommodating, I don't think I ever once thanked them without saying as a tag to it, how will their success in this assignment where you have accommodated all of these um, challenges, put them in a position to succeed next year in this course. They won't have you for grade 11. They won't have you for grade seven. They won't have you after they finish high school. How are they going to take the success that they were able to have when they collaborated with you and move forward to someone who is not going to be as collaborative. And I was assuming, and I think rightfully that there's not always going to be accommodating and um, available uh, people in their lives. Um, so I think in order to sort of really answer thoroughly, I'd have to sort of reconsider and redigest the parts of the, conversation that I've been hearing up till now with my parent hat on rather than my personal hat on. Um, but really, it comes back. I'm biased to say it, it's this intention idea. If, if the people in the space intend to accommodate, then they will. They will find a way to accommodate. Just like if someone intends to get to a certain destination on a roadway, and they work toward doing it, they're going to get to their destination. You may not have everyone agreed on the route, but in the end, they're going to get to the final spot. Um, so I'd need, I'd need more time to reflect. So just in listening to that, my guess, like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like the way the classroom and the activities are designed in the boys school is not designed with universal design in mind because they were always having to accommodate. Yeah, I'd be comfortable saying that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because people, educators, teachers, unit heads, they use phrases and how many times have I sat in a room and said, I don't think we're talking about the same thing, or I don't think that word means quite what you think that word means, but they're framing it as though they are. Um, and then that comes, you know, like there are many people who just, they didn't, 
no, they truly didn't know. They thought they were being accommodating and they didn't realize that it wasn't helpful. Um, you know, how many people think that, you know, I'll give them a longer timeline. I'll delay the deadline and then, then the assignment will become possible. Well, no, because now you've removed the sense of urgency. So you've, you've interfered with their sort of like the natural ebb and flow of the classroom behavior impacting on them and their motivation. And you've also just pushed it into another course timeline. And now your assignment, this, you know, fictitious, whatever, this assignment for this course isn't due on the same day, it's due later. And now it's going to sort of butt heads with this other um, opportunity, like this other evaluation timeline. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, I'm comfortable saying yes, that they, that they don't, but I also know that I never was ever in a situation where the teacher didn't say they were trying. What sort of impact did that have on, 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 on your kids in terms of realizing that they were always having to ask for accommodations? Um, well, they, they, they didn't always, they just simply truly didn't always, but, but the number of kids in the classroom that had access to accommodations truly outnumbered the number of kids who didn't. So I think that's where like every educator felt that they were offering you know, universal supports because truly more than half the kids have some kind of an IEP. And so therefore everyone sort of just walks into the space assuming that an IEP is going to be an option. I don't know. I, I, I'm really, I'm really enjoying the conversation that I'm listening to, but I, I feel unprepared to sort of like represent my kids experience. I don't, I'm not yet sort of savvy enough in this conversation to sort of know what pieces make sense to share. Um, and I also, I strongly, strongly, strongly feel that their story is their story. And, and oh, absolutely. me, you know, me sharing it isn't even within my sort of rights at this point in their lives. Um, but it, it's, you know, I mean, I, I have my own unique experience, but, but, I don't, I really don't know. I, I, in fact, I'm confident that there's many times where I've asked them that they've not had the same perspective as I have had for the same assignment. You know, things that I've been disappointed with or things that I've been impressed with, they've kind of gone, oh, I didn't, uh -uh. I don't think so, mom. You know, like, I don't know which course you're talking about, but that wasn't the one that I was in. So yeah, I don't, I don't know how much I can add to the conversation at this moment. So how much, Sorry. Carrie, just, I know, Carrie, I just, I'm, I appreciate that perspective. Would it, would the experience for you have, and maybe I'm wrong and maybe, maybe educators did this with you. So please correct me if I'm not correct, mm -hmm. but did you have teachers come to you and say what works in your family or with your child or is, as, you know, as a collaborative, the three of us, and this is what we're going to do. Or was that a question that, had to come up because you had to advocate for um, accommodation. Like, was it ever just a standard, mm -hmm. what are we going to do for you, for the child as an individual, as the student as an individual, or was it, what are we going to do to reduce the workload? We're going to aim for the middle. Mm -hmm. So prior to my boys being enrolled in their school, there were conversations uh, literally prior to their enrollment and that conversation was revisited every single year um mm -hmm. uh did they ever ask me what works for you and what would you like i don't know that that open-ended question i don't think i can recall that ever being asked it mm -hmm. was more um given the profile that we're working with, given the sort of labels and, and, you know, sort of generalized terms that we're going to be using in this situation, we're going to assume that these are what needs to happen. And, and mm -hmm. there were times, and there were some teachers whose their big result, their big uh, 
solution was, you know, let's just put away all the deadlines. Let's not worry about any deadlines. And I have said to those teachers many times over, please don't. If you want to shift the deadline, make it earlier. And Mm -hmm. some of them listened. Mm -hmm. uh, And some of them listened strongly. And then they they came back and they'd look at my child in the face and they'd say, okay, um, I don't think I'm helping you by giving you a further deadline. I'm just thinking I'm giving you sort of like a bigger, more sloppy soup to swim in. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to see your assignment three days before. When you submit it to me, if you, after submitting it, make an appointment, we will review all of the assignment criteria, the rubric, whatever, whatever. And then you can decide what to do with the next three days. And do you want to resubmit it? Do you want to edit it? Do you want to leave it as it is? That sort of thing. Um, And that always was very helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, like this, this delayed deadline was always, always a disaster. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd say, oddly, often the the biggest struggle was when the teacher, the educator would, would see themselves reflected in one of my kids. And they'd say, Oh, I, I, I lived that life. I'm that guy. That was me in grade, whatever, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to do. And then they just projected all of their own experiences Mm -hmm. onto the learner. And they're like, we're going to make this perfect. Um, no, <laughs> no, it didn't go perfectly at all. So there, again, like this question of, did they ask us when they were more open to asking? And, and I don't think I was ever directly asked open endedly what works for your family, but the more open people were to what works for your family or listening to when we gave them feedback, then definitely the more successful it went the more mm-hmm. successfully like mm-hmm. I think you've mm-hmm. just hit on a very big piece of universal design and then that that and that's why I think I didn't like universal design to begin with as a moniker because it implies that you have the answer on how to create something and I think the intention of asking those open ended questions of what do you need in order to be successful is the role that a facilitator or an educator or an an, an educational design person needs to needs to ask and mm-hmm. it's it, you're just not going to have that uh, response with people if you don't have the intention of what my design is may not work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And to be egoless um, about with it. That, mm-hmm. With that, and and if, Carrie, if you don't, if this isn't something you're comfortable in ask, answering, just 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 feel free to tell me so, um, which I know you will anyhow. Um, <laughs> but with that, like, how much? how much were your kids involved in those discussions? Uh, constantly. Yeah. Um, I, I would say if I've had 70 conversations, I don't think I've had two without them in the room. And each and every one of the times that they weren't in the room was a scenario where the teacher was truly heartfully approaching the intention to be accommodating and it wasn't working. And I felt that I wanted to um, uh, insulate the re- the relationship between the teacher and my, my student and not put my student in a position to be in the room where I explicitly disagreed with the teacher. I always tried to be much more collaborative and much more, I hear you're saying this, to me, this means that's your goal. In my opinion, the way to reach this goal is not through the route you just described, but to use this route instead. Um, when conversations like that weren't getting me to the point that I thought that the educator was taking on um, what I thought we needed. And inevitably, I, I always, always, always allowed one or two assignments to go and try it their way, because I truly do believe that the dynamic relationship between every single individual pairing or grouping, it can shift the way that things work out, right? You know, certain teachers get certain results from certain kids by cajoling and some get by being stern and, you know, yada, yada, all of those variations. Um, So there was, I think, there was definitely once, and I think there may have been a second time where I asked to see the educator independent of my child. And that was me saying, I would like, the chance to just really clearly say things to you directly without having to 
couch it at all. And I don't want my student to have any, um, either any of like the fallout of kind of being in the room and having educators ego possibly being bruised or to have my student see a dynamic that I didn't want them to see from me. I didn't want them to see me being as stern or as blunt as what I imagined I would have to. Um, now, and with those conversations, because you're somebody who's a lot more insightful and empathetic than most people were, was, was, was the student involved in the conversation because that's how the, the teacher set it up or was that because that's what you requested? Um, I would say it's the way the school approached the perspective like that, that there was always um, the triad. So student, parent, teacher, sometimes student, parent, teacher, unit head, student, parent, teacher, principal. Um, but student, parent, teacher was the basic expectation. That was, um, now there definitely were conversations, especially as the kids get older, that it's the student and the teacher directly and that I'm not in the room. I don't know what ha is happening and I don't need to know what's happening. Um, but any time that it was a homeschool conference, the student was always expected to be there. And in fact, um, the school has a phrasing for it and it's called student-led conferences. And that's, so that's one of the things that routinely is available every semester and sometimes multiple times through the semester, um, depending on like kind of at what phase they are in the whole realm of k through to grade 12 um and the the um school expectation is that the kids come into and this is not just kids who have accommodations this is every student in the room uh comes into their student-led interviews um with some talking points and then some open-ended discussion questions that they then share with the space and without fail the teachers, no matter how strong, no matter what my opinion of, of their strength to accommodate or not, I, every single teacher respected this student-led model. I was always impressed with that. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. I think that speaks volumes to the shift that's happening in education. We were talking about it at the top of this conversation is that we are seeing a shift. Things are starting to change. We're not mm -hmm. there yet in terms of it being effective for everyone. But I do see giant shifts. And I think I'm going to speak, I know Carrie, you're in Ontario, but I'm going to speak to curriculum, the guidelines that's out there for what you have, what teachers have to teach. Um, in the K-12 to system, the curriculum has taken a massive shift in BC in the last five years. Massive. It's not even remotely the same. And I think that it's shifted in a way that allows for all of the things we've been talking about here today to be something that people think about is it's goal, goal oriented. How do we get to that big picture idea? Um, and does it have to be the way that we've always done it? And, and I don't think that that's the answer anymore. Well, and I think there's like, you know, with some of this that we've been talking about too, in terms of giving the students choice and in terms of allowing them to find their own pathways to, to, to reach that end goal. Um, one of the criticisms that uh, universal design has had at certain points from some people when they're first introduced to it is, is the notion that, uh, that things are being dumbed down, but yeah. that is not what's happening. Rather, it's giving the like the learner ownership over their education and mm -hmm. uh, building expertise in learning, and and that's what I like, you know, that I just heard from Carrie with the fact that those those um, those are student led uh, meetings, sort of, you yeah. Know, as an educator, that's heartening to hear that it's happening elsewhere. I know that it was happening in the schools that I was in and the conversations that we were having. Um, but it's really awesome to hear that it's happening elsewhere, especially, you know, however many provinces away from where I taught. I mean, that's fantastic <laughs> news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And I'll tell you, like, I have now children that are outside of high school and are like entering workforce 
And I see echoes of their ability to like actually start a meeting. They know how to start a conversation that's actually a meeting, not just a hi, how are you conversation. Um, they know how to think through what's my goal for this conversation. How do I introduce it kindly and and openly and, and you know inclusively, like uh, invitingly. Um, it really it, it's it's fantastic. Um, so. What advice would you give to a teacher, designer, um, or parent that finds all this to be daunting and overwhelming as they're sort of first approaching the idea of universal design for learning with, with, with their students? Erica, is that to me? It's to either one of you. Actually, it's okay. to both of you. Okay. Okay. Um, well, maybe I can just sort of... <laughs> Um, take advantage of Lori's ta- uh, phrasing earlier. And uh, I think if an educator starts with what works and building from that success and listening to what works, then the family, the student, the, the people coming into the space with experience in that specific learner's ex- life, you really sort of um, very quickly get a tangible set of accommodations, experiences, whatever scenarios that have worked in the past. And I would imagine that any educator with a certain amount of experience and a certain amount of sort of uh, intention can listen to that and say, okay, I've got the skills, I've got the experience, I've got the um, uh, resources to do these things this way. And everyone will naturally adapt to their individual nuance like their their own kind of personal fingerprint um and then you can move forward from there i really 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 like laurie how you uh that question i would have loved to have had someone ask me what works for your family that that seems like a beautiful starting point yeah i think that's key to and part of that is um is training and education for educators it's 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 giving the time and the respect and the, you know, of education and what, you know, Carrie, you hit, you you said it so eloquently that teachers are going to adapt what they know how to do to a situation and respecting the fact that, you know, there's a lot of education behind being an educator. Um, They've worked on it. They have this vast uh, amount of knowledge. They may not have it in the area that is necessary, but affording them the, the, the opportunity to do that without negating the fact that they have all of this expertise. And so starting with an open-ended question with parents is the same conversation you need to have with an educator as someone uh, who is, let's say in administration or, you know, in, in a role, a unit supervisor, or however you're broken, it's broken down um, is, you know, what works for you and in your classroom. And so it's about meshing all of these things together because as a teacher um, I have strengths and I have weaknesses, uh, uh, you know, and things I'm working on or things that I don't really understand or things that I do really, really well. And maybe it's not, it doesn't work for that student, but it's about treating education on the whole as something that happens between individuals, whether it's the teacher or the student or the parent or the combination, it's remembering that we all have strengths and that there's always a way to for someone to learn something that learning is it, it, it learning is universal it can happen it's mm-hmm. about finding the way in which that happens and I think that those open-ended questions need to happen on multiple levels within the hierarchy of an institution mm-hmm. um, so we've touched a few times during the program um, about terms and uh, um, and you know things that you've liked about universal design and things that we haven't or things like that over the years. Um, uh, and so, so there is, there is a term that's being used right now, um, uh, more recently called inclusive design. Um, so how would you describe inclusive design? Do have either of you sort of touched on it before in your. Yeah, I have, I don't, I don't care if you've encountered it with your, with your kids, but I honestly think that there's a, this might be a good shift. The reason is, is that universal design, as I started at the outset, had this really 
defined moment in education early on um, that was erroneous and it, and it led to misconceptions and myths about what universal design was in terms of workload and what you had to do as an educator. And so the shift to inclusive design, I think takes the in original intention potentially of some educators with using the moniker universal design and shifts it to inclusive. And it takes away the baggage of this old definition that meant that it was a silver bullet. It was good for everyone. I'm just going to do it this way and it's fine. And inclusive, I think, shifts the mindset to we're dealing with individuals here and we have to be inclusive of all individuals' needs. And so that's the way I see the shift happening is that universal design was something that we created, I think, with the intention as educators, at least that was how I viewed it, um, <clears throat> to be inclusive by, okay, we're going to universally design something that allows for everyone to participate. Um, but we had this definition that got mired in educational and edu speak and, and, and sort of opera operaization. I'm sorry. I can't say that word. <laughs> um, and, you know, in, in terms of implement, yes, in terms of implementing it and it just went sideways. And I think that inclusive education is an opportunity to revisit potentially what the core values of universal design were. Um, yeah, and as yeah. I said, like, I think with some of the people who've been looking at it, there are some misconceptions in there. But I think a lot of those misconceptions come from that idea of, um, well, probably different stages in universal designs history. Um, but come around the also the idea of, of um, thinking that universal design is one size fits all as opposed to recognizing that it's about building in flexibility and choice. Mm -hmm. Well, I sounds, Lori, your answer sounds very empowering. The idea of just even exploring how these two terms are used and how they're operationalized and, and what their intention is. And if, if as a, as the people tasked with implementing universal design or inclusive design if you can explore and unpack what are these words what are our goals why are we using these phrases which phrase suits us and our intentions better then you know that's probably going to be or at least i would hope that would be a powerful step toward defining the idea that it's an intention or it's it's a it's a results based plan rather than a um, window dressing type plan. You know, it doesn't need to look like, good. It needs to be functional. I like that you used in like, you know, the intention based and the functional in there. Cause this was, i not sure if you were on the show earlier, Carrie, when, when, when we were talking about um, UBC, they're very big on talking inclusivity, 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 and sort of stating that. Um, but as I've, approached um, the accessibility uh, at UBC <laughs> throughout my master's, um, it has slightly been window dressing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's exhausting, it, right? Like that just uses up so much of everyone's energies. Well, you know, I, you know, and I really, I've seen it this last couple of weeks as I've been introduced to all these different tools that I should have had access to and that other students at UBC should have had access to and kind of then seeing the difference between that and BCIT where I teach, which BCIT isn't perfect, but the accessibility tools are accessible to all students. You do not have to have had a doctor's note and an agreement to allow you permission to enter the accessibility center. And so often when I've needed help from the accessibility center, it has been very limited in what I'm introduced to or offered in that space. Um, and, and, and I, and this is, this is the one area where, where I have concern with, with whenever we come out with a new term is 
is is just that 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 concern that the new term is driven by you know elements of ego of wanting to coin a term as opposed to actually you know using the term to do positive good out there and certainly there's a lot of positive you know connotations when you think about inclusivity because part of it too is is that that it's to be inclusive of all. And so, so in the description for inclusive design, they actually make note too about talking about languages and culture mm -hmm. uh, and things like that in there, as well as, um, as sort of the underlying route to, to uh, inclusive design, which, 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 which goes to disability as well. Um, like in, in making sure that that it's accessible to all. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I see. To go back to that that cartoon that I talked about at the very beginning of the the three individuals watching the baseball game with the fence, and that universal design. The solution was to provide the boxes that were a couple of different sizes so that everyone could see over the fence. Mm. The way I see it is. Inclusive, inclusive design is removing the fence. Mm. So, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, Shelley Moore um, has a great way of sort of looking at inclusive design in terms of colored dots uh, inside of a circle and where you fall within that circle. So whether you're othered outside, whether your design overlaps and some of you are included and some of you aren't. And the goal is to have all the dots inside the circle. Well, I want to take it one step further and say all the dots, no circle. Yeah. I, I you know, I think that removing systematic barriers mm -hmm. to access education is absolutely the key to inclusive design. It's removing those preconceived notions of how someone achieves a goal. And I think that's very hard to do. And I think we're at the beginning steps of it. And I think that patience as an educator is uh, is going to be key because the system hasn't caught up with that idea yet. So, so um, as like, this is, this is, I always have such um, wonderfully interesting guests when, whenever, um, <laughs> which, which makes it very difficult to, to end the show. Cause I always yeah. gotta, keep on keep on chatting and uh, yeah. and you always find new layers but um sort of being cognizant to the fact that uh that we're just approaching an hour and a half of the show now um yeah. which doesn't seem that long because because uh because you, you're just both such a joy to chat with um and so interesting um sort of just so on some final words and uh as we look at sort of uh, wrapping up the show for today, how how would you recommend um, somebody get started on putting universal and inclusive, whichever term you want to use, but with the idea that we're providing students with, uh, uh, you know, with with choices to make learning accessible to, to, to everyone and, um, and allowing, you know, giving them the tools so that they can, they can build their pathways to, to reaching, reaching, um, their, the goals, their goals, um, with the educational material, how would you recommend somebody get started with putting this in place? Especially, you know, thinking that, I, I know, Laurie, earlier you were talking about that you ultimately want to think of it at the get-go as you're first designing the course. But mm -hmm. the reality is X number of teachers out there have their courses designed. And so, and now they're learning that that this is probably something, well, it's not probably, it is something <laughs> they should be thinking about. How, how, how should they get started? Well... <clears throat> Carrie, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try not to steal your thunder because I do think you very eloquently put exactly what matters at the beginning. Um, and so I'll leave that to you to discuss because I think that that's key. But I if you're an educator and you have your course designed and you've been doing it for a long period of time, that's a survival mechanism. <laughs> I have things laid out. I can now have time to do other things. 
And now you're starting to realize that potentially what you have is not completely inclusive. Um, it's just that open-mindedness to be able to say, I don't think I have it all. I don't think I have this covered and where do I go next? And then it's about creating those individualized conversations about how to help the student that you're dealing with at the time. It's not about the student that's going to be there in five years. It's not about the student that you had last, last semester. It's about who's in front of me now and what is the open-ended question I can ask them, how does this best work for you in order to create something that gets your students to the ultimate goal of whatever you have created? And just, you have to be open to using mm -hmm. multiple tools and sometimes to be uncomfortable with the fact that you don't know how to yes. use that tool. Yes. And yes, I Laura, think it's, a, it's about comfortability and you have to be willing to say, one, I don't know, two, I will find out, and three, can you show me? Yeah. yeah. And I think that those are the big three things is you have to be willing to say, I don't know, can you show me how to do it? Or I'll find out how to do it and listen to the person that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Laurie, I think that's, that's amazing. And actually in, in listening to what you're saying, I felt, I noticed of myself, the idea of being willing to take that on actually takes bravery, right? Oh, so absolutely. if you walk into the space, recognizing I am actually going to have to be brave enough to ask this question and be open to what I receive, but by opening the conversation and being willing to accept information from the key experts, then actually my job will become easier because they're going to direct me. They're going to help me. They're going to give me tons and tons and tons and tons of roadmaps so that I can meet my intention, which is to have a successful dynamic, have there's, learning happen. There's intention. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You did, you, yeah. I mean, you've done such a good job of laying that out all the way through this conversation is that intention is is key. And because intention leads to having those open ended conversations and being willing to be wrong and be willing to be corrected and be willing to head in a different direction that you didn't know about. Yeah. And maybe, you know, obviously, I've represented uh, for the majority of my conversation, my comments have represented sort of the parent perspective it also is required that that bravery and that intention is dynamic because it is very, very, very possible. It's I, in my experience and a sure thing that when someone takes your comments and goes about it with their own individual manner or their own individual fingerprint on the, the action, you will learn. They may mm -hmm. do it better than you've ever seen it before. They may do it worse than you've ever seen it before, but if you are watching, you will learn. And you will understand more about how your child needs to be accommodated by seeing how those individual differences vary and the outcomes that come out of it, how the outcomes vary. So yeah, yeah, it's been lovely speaking with you all. I look forward to the next conversation. I'm <laughs> gonna be clicking out. Best wishes to everyone. Okay, those, Thanks, are some, Carrie. those are some really strong words from Lori and, and uh, Carrie and advice um, to end that, the show on. So thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, on this episode of Encounters in EdTech. And uh, I know as we wrap things up that I'm hoping that both Lori and Carrie will join us on future episodes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, bye for now.